So yes, I think we can now start. So uh, a big welcome to you all. Thank you for joining this event at the British Institute of Ankara. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute and uh, we are really happy to have with us together today Antonis Hatikiriakou, who is also a very good friend of mine, so double <laughs> the joy. Uh, Antonis uh, is Assistant Professor of Early, Mor Early Modern Ottoman and Mediterranean History at Boazis University. He started a month and a half ago, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. And he's also a fellow at the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis, SESTA, at Stanford University. He holds a PhD in history from SOAS in London, and he has previously worked at several universities and taught at them, including Princeton, SOAS, University of Cyprus in Rethymno, uh, University of Crete in Rethymno, and the University of Cyprus. And he, between 2014 and 2016, just before he arrived uh, at uh, Bohazici, uh, he was the Marie Curie Intra-European Fellow at the Institute for Mediterranean Studies, Foundation for Research and Technology, Hellas in Rethymno, Greece. He's currently completing his monograph entitled Insularity and Empire, Ottoman Cyprus in the Early Modern Mediterranean, and his research interests include spatial history, environmental and climate history, social and economic history, and the Mediterranean at large. His new collaborative project with uh, Ali Yajiolu, this is with in Stanford, Stanford University, sorry, maps the realms and relationships of Tepe Delenli Ali Pasha in the Western Balkans at the turn of the 19th century. Today, uh, we, I, it was announced like this, and uh, few hour, until a few hours ago it was like this. Uh, Oktay Hoja, uh, Oktay Uzel would be with us as a discussant, but unfortunately he is sick, so he will not be here, but he will probably share his comments with Antonis, and maybe we could share with the group that participated. So, the floor to you. <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Leo, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for me to be here and meet uh, old friends and make new ones as well. So uh, I'm glad to be here. And uh, what I'm, what I'll be presenting today uh, is basically the result of uh, the research I've conducted over the past two and a half years in Crete, um, which is <coughs> uh, it was this uh, project uh, entitled Mediterranean Insularities. Space, Landscape and Agriculture in Early Modern Cyprus and Crete. Uh, this was a project funded by the Marie Actions of the European Commission and it, was a com it is a comparative history, spatial history, of Early Modern Cyprus and Crete. Um, and the objective of the project was to map the trends and patterns in the economy of the two islands. This was something that uh, emerged out of my doctoral research which was essentially a social and economic history of Ottoman Cyprus in the 18th century uh, and during that research I was able to acquire a rather uh, qualitative let's say sense of uh, the economy of Cyprus and um, towards the end of that research I uh, was very anxious and very uh, eager to get my hands on more quantitative data. Uh, and I was able to make certain comparisons with, with Crete, which I wanted to pursue further. So the particular source um, that the project looked at, the Mufassal Defteri, the detailed fiscal survey conducted upon the conquest of the island, was uh, a particularly fascinating prospect and uh, what I had the opportunity to um, explore. And the starting point of this research uh, was this widespread idea that the two islands are very similar. And of course, uh, in more ways than one, they are. If we look at the size, if we look at the culture, uh, they're quite similar to each other. But what can we learn if we re reverse this logic? Uh, what can we find out if we treat the two islands as uh, different? Uh, so if we look at the economy, for example, uh, the dominant uh, crops uh, in the uh, economy of Cyprus were wheat, cotton and silk. And in the case of um, Crete, 
we had uh, vine trees and uh, olive trees. So while both islands had export-oriented cash crop economies, those uh, were of very, very different crops. So those choices, why the two islands chose to focus on completely different kind of crops, was a question that really intrigued me. And in doing so, I started thinking and looking at the economy, uh, the climate, environment, and landscape. Uh, these were the sort of main analytical uh, units, let's say. And of course, here Brodel comes to mind, uh, his famous uh, trinity of uh, Mediterranean crops, omnipresent, according to Brodel, throughout the Mediterranean, cereals, vines, and olive trees. And we have the more recent work of Farouk Tabak, who is revising this trinity and categorizes, proposes a different categorization between, well, he keeps cereals, but then he groups tree crops together, uh, and then he adds a third category, oriental crops, which by which he refers to um, the cotton plant, sugarcane, um, mulberry trees as, as uh, cultivations that came from the east uh, to the Mediterranean. Now, how applicable is this in the case uh, of Cyprus that we are uh, exploring right now? Well, sugar was something that was particularly uh, prominent uh, in, in, in Venetian times all the way up to the 17th century. Uh, and then, of course, we have cotton and mulberry trees necessary for <coughs> sericulture, for uh, silk. Now, all these are water-intensive <coughs> cultivations. And those of you who are familiar with or have been in Cyprus, uh, and any current observer of the Cypriot landscape would be incredulous to the possibility of uh, these kind of crops being cultivated in the gr dry, semi-arid conditions uh, on the island. How were these kind of crops sustainable? And remember, this is not you know, small-scale cultivation. This is export-oriented. Sugar, for example, uh, Cyprus was, for a long time, it was one of, was the main producer of sugar uh, for Europe in medieval times. Um, and uh, there are several reasons why, how these particularly thirsty crops were sustainable uh, in, um, in Cyprus. Uh, the most important of which is the Little Ice Age, um, this um, uh, rather complicated phenomenon that I don't have time to go into at this stage, but I'm happy to uh, elaborate on later during the Q&A. Um, and basically, this is a time from the, this is a period from the 14th to the 19th century um, with global uh, climate changes, uh, the manifestations of which in the Mediterranean included higher precipitation, more snowfall, and periodic uh, droughts. So let's look at the example uh, of sugar. And uh, a good case study is um, the village of Kuklia in so southwest Cyprus that used to be a medieval uh, estate uh, and was a major sugarcane uh, cultivation and processing site. Uh, and I was uh, lucky enough to be uh, invited by Professor Maria Yagovu of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus, who is the head of um, the um, uh, Palebafos Urban Landscape Project PAUP uh, during their excavations um, last uh, summer and I was able to really appreciate uh, the, the, the landscape and as a historian acquire a, a different understanding of um, what, this, uh, what this means um, and here this used to be a sugarcane plantation, mm -hmm. what you see here. Uh, and I think it looks a little bit more, a little bit greener than what it's supposed to be. Uh, in the picture that I have here, it's completely yellow. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> so there's some kind of conspiracy going on with the projector. Uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of putting that image, but anyway. Um, so in this, this very yellow landscape, imagine it. <laughs> uh, and this is the beginning of the summer. This is early June. Um, and this used to be, as I said, a Lusignan Venetian estate, later an Ottoman chief clique. And water um, was necessary for um, irrigation of sugarcane. Uh, and um, one feature is, is the fact that sugarcane also dries, uses the underground uh, water resources. Therefore, you have overexploitation of aquifers. Um, but water is also important not just for irrigation but as a source of power. The uh, mill that you he see here that crushes uh, the sugar cane uh, is powered by uh, water. Therefore, you need constant supply of running water that powers um, the mills. And uh, pressures upon natural resources take other forms as well. Uh, wood is necessary for uh, the uh, sugar processing uh, for processing the uh, the sugar refining sugar process um, and in this case if you look at the horizon here where you see those um, uh, wind uh, farms um, these the hills at the back are called the Orides forest Orides, which means kind of hilly, mountainous like. Uh, and of course, there's no forest there. I mean, what you see is just bushes. And as with any sort of toponymic misnomer, there is an explanation. And the explanation being that after 400 years of sugarcane uh, processing, the, uh, the trees, the wood from the trees that used to um, fuel the, uh, the uh, refining process uh, rendered the, this uh, hill completely bald and simply full of uh, bushes at the time, at, at the, uh, in these hills. And of course, in the forest stead now stand wind turbines. Um, so from the medieval to the postmodern era, not much has changed. And the importance here regarding uh, wood is I cannot overemphasize how important that is. Madeira, which substituted Cyprus as the major producer of sugar uh, throughout Europe in the uh, 15th and 16th century, the word actually means wood. And it was a, a, an island full of forests. Now, if you go there, it's completely arid. There's nothing left. So the impact on the environment that sugarcane cultivation has in processing is uh, massive. And these are precisely the kind of um, this discrepancy between the present day climate and environmental, uh, the cli climate, the environment, and landscape uh, in relation to early modern water intensive agriculture, uh, these kind of questions are really what feeds the curiosity behind this project. So let's um, look at the source I looked at, uh, the Kubris Mokassal Bakteri, the detailed fiscal survey of Cyprus kept at the um, Tabuga Kadastro Ashiri in Ankara, luckily published in facsimile. It records 1,137 villages and other settlements. It has uh, partial population data, and by that uh, I'm referring to the uh, household, Hane, uh, which of course doesn't correspond to population. It's, it's a household which could mean anything, and that's the main problem we have as Ottomanists regarding, Ottomanist historians regarding our uh, data. There's uh, important information regarding toponyms and uh, onomatology. Uh, it includes uh, data on the volume and value of taxable population production, 
uh, uh, sorry, taxable production of each uh, village. And really, sorry, really, uh, this is a snapshot of the rural landscape of Cyprus at a very exceptional moment. And that moment was the end of Venetian rule, so really what we have here, uh, what is depicted here are more the Venetian rather than the Ottoman conditions. Uh, and secondly, this is a snapshot of the Cypriot landscape after two years of warfare, uh, which uh, obviously uh, laid a heavy toll on the rural uh, landscape and uh, economy. Uh, and at a third level, of course, depopulation, again because of the war, either through um, death or uh, emigration. So, by all means, this is not, these are not normal conditions. Uh, nevertheless, this is uh, perhaps the most detailed uh, source that we have. With these considerations, we can go on and uh, see how we can assess its trustworthiness. <clears throat> now, these kind of Takhir surveys are notoriously problematic. There's a, there are huge debates within Ottoman historiography how to treat them. And John Alexander has examined the equivalent registers for the Peloponnese and uh, Euboia. Uh, and, statistic and tested the statistical correlation uh, between um, wheat and barley. Uh, he looked at the coefficient of the determination, R square, to see whether there is a strong relationship between these two, uh, the, the values of these two uh, goods. Uh, and he finds uh, 0.99 for the Peloponnese and 0.98 for Euboia. Now this means that there is a very, very strong correlation which tells us that this uh, data is not random uh, and it's rather predictable, which in turn means that they are kind of applying a sort of a ratio here. Um, we have an estimation uh, rather than a recording of actual uh, conditions. Now, this doesn't mean that the data is completely useless. Uh, what uh, Alexander uh, speculates is that this is a kind of a con concealed lump sum that is being recorded here, therefore not actual figures of volume, but rather a rough uh, estimate based on the relationship between those uh, to crops. Um, and of course this is the nature of any kind of fiscal data. I mean even today in the most modern or sophisticated state if you look at its fiscal data you're not going to expect to get a detailed understanding of the economy itself. So with these issues in mind let's see what that may mean in the case of Cyprus. We do, if we do exactly the same analysis um, we see that the uh, R-square in the case of Cyprus is 0 0.555. Uh, the correlation between b wheat and barley. Now this tells us that there is no strong relationship between the two and therefore we can uh, trust that the data is random, that there is no ratio between them and it is relatively um, uh, trustworthy as an indication of trends and patterns in the economy. So what does the register look like? Here we have a somewhat average uh, example, the village of Sotira in the sub-district of uh, Mesauria, Mesaria. Uh, the, the register records uh, the district on top Nahiyei Mesaria, Kariyei Sodira, Der Nahiyei Mesbur. And then we have the names of the heads of households. Uh, and on the other um, side of the page, we have a list of all the goods, uh, the volume of all the goods and the uh, assessed taxes, the, which is about uh, tw it is 20%. Uh, therefore, if we want to uh, calculate the 
uh, total production we would multiply by five. How are we entering the data? Well, there's a, uh, I used, uh, we have a spreadsheet with the uh, Ottoman place name as it is recorded in 1572, the present day toponym. The, I'm lucky enough to have a very detailed Venetian study uh, close, very close to the Ottoman one from 1565, so that allows me to un identify with a good deal of accuracy the different uh, place names uh, upon which I can have the uh, coordinates for uh, GIS uh, analysis. We have a total of 941 um, villages that uh, the register gives uh, detailed agricultural fiscal data for the remaining from the 1137 are settlements, mezras, for which you simply have a monetary total sum, so we don't know what is being produced there, it's just the value of the tax paid, so for my purposes that's useless. And out of those 941 villages, 529 are extant and therefore have coordinates. Now, how do we visualize this data on a map? And I have to confess at this stage uh, that addressing a, an audience of largely uh, archaeologists, uh, I'm assuming, uh, I feel like the neophyte preaching um, the choir. HGIS is very new uh, for historians and it's at a quite experimental stage. I myself am new to this. Uh, feel so I feel rather humbled to present this work uh, to uh, an audience that has had a disciplinary experience with GIS for several decades. So I would gladly uh, invite uh, any suggestions and ideas um, since I am at the very early stage of uh, processing these data and possibilities uh, really uh, are endless. So, oh, and then of course we have 51 categories of taxes dues, fines and uh, customs over 200 columns from the uh, register itself. Now let's have a look at uh, Cyprus, uh, get an idea of the geography, uh, the main uh, mountainous region uh, in the center, uh, Trodos Mountains, Karluda in, in Ottoman, Snowy Mountain, again a very uh, alienating uh, uh, sort of name for a present day uh, observer of Cyprus. The snowy mountain is not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the Torres Mountains. Um, here are the 529 villages uh, I've uh, mentioned. There's a pretty good distribution um, apart from the uh, north uh, western uh, region. Um, and let me say a few things that how uh, I've tried to visualize and the methods I've used in visualizing this data. Now, what I've done is that I've uh, used uh, inverse distance weighted interpolation, um, which is a method of grouping points on the map together, assuming that they behave uh, in a similar fashion. So the regions that you see do not, not strictly correspond to a point on the map, but rather to a group of villages that are in the same region, roughly. The assumption here, uh, as I said, is that uh, points on the map that are close to each other behave similarly. Therefore, uh, we can uh, somehow mitigate <coughs> the loss of data from the villages that have not been a geo reference that we do not have geographic coordinates for. There are some shortcomings uh, of, for this method, of course, but uh, this is the major um, sort of benefit. Uh, and what it really allows us to do is to get an idea of the general trends and patterns. So, as all maps are inherently misleading this one is as well, and here are the sort of caveats. Um, 
and uh, the way one should read this map as is as an indication of trends and patterns rather than an absolute um, depiction of where high concentrations of wheat are. Uh, to make it more uh, tangible for you, you know, in one of these uh, areas there may be a, a, a canyon where you cannot cultivate wheat, obviously. Uh, that's not the purpose of such a visualization. It's just to give you a rough idea. Um, so uh, we see the high areas of concentration uh, in the north um, west of the island and here's another way of how this visualization can be misleading. The last, uh, this high concentration that you see here uh, again does not necessarily depict reality. The last village, the last point of the map is right here. And then there's nothing up to the coastline. So what this method does is it just uh, expands it up to the last point and that is why that whole area is depicted as if it's full of uh, wheat, which it may not necessarily be. That's not the point of this visualization. Otherwise, uh, apart from that, um, we are generally, I can be generally confident about the overall general idea uh, of the trends regarding wheat. Um, one um, uh, way of testing this method is to do a hotspot analysis, uh, which takes um, a point by point and assesses the statistical value of the statistical importance of each point and wherever we have read it tells us that there is um, uh, there is it is very important statistically uh, cold uh, well when it's yellow it's not significant when it's wild it is uh, white is colder and blue is uh, insignificant so in the mountainous area here that confirms the validity of our data the mountainous area has uh, statistically insignificant uh, data which makes uh, perfect sense uh, and largely it confirms the rest of the picture. Uh, sorry, can I ask? Of course. Uh, are, uh, uh, in this map, is the amount of the wheat playing, uh, playing more importance or the number of villages? No, this is the amount of wood. What we're looking at is the amount of wood. So, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is That's the amount of wood that we're looking at. We're, we, this is the spatial distribution of wood, okay. um, according to the according to the register. Now, this was a complete shock to me. Uh, what I've done here is I've uh, divided the amount of wood produced by each village by its household as which I assume that it's a unit of production. Uh, that doesn't tell us much about population, as I said, but if we assume that a hane is one unit of production, then we can get an idea of how it is distributed within uh, a village. Now, the shocking thing here is that the regional differentiation that you see pretty much accurately depict the administrative boundaries of the island. In extreme detail, every shade difference goes to a different Nathia. So you have Nicosia, you have Mesaria, you have Magosa here, Karpas, Girne, Bendaya, Hirsoku, Baf, Evdim, Limasol, Mazotos, Tuzla. I was completely shocked by this. And I don't have an explanation, a complete explanation as yet. The only thing I can speculate, I can sort of consider, is the strong correlation between uh, nutrition, subsistence, and uh, these particular kinds of crops, uh, which would explain a uniformity within a region, perhaps. Uh, the other shock about this map is where the high concentration is. 
Now, if you talk to any Cypriot today, or if indeed you've been to Cyprus or know anything about Cyprus, you would know that the granary of the island, and not just the island, the gra- it used to be the granary of Venice, was the Messaria plain between the two mountain ranges from the east to the west of the island. And here you have a very low distribution of wheat. We saw that before as well. The explanation that I would offer is twofold. One uh, is the war. And the main areas of uh, battles were in Famagusta, Magosa, and Nicosia in the middle. That's where you had sieges. All the other parts of the island essentially surrendered. So that's where the military would loot, would take um, uh, supplies from, and that would be the area that would be most hardly hit by the two year long uh, war con- conditions of warfare. Um, the other uh, regarding the concentration to the south again uh, a very speculative answer may have to do with um, population rate ratio or household ratio if this was more thinly populated then uh, such a high concentration would be explicable but there's no way of uh, confirming this assumption. Let's move on to some more uh, barley. It's ve- I mean, it goes hand in hand with um, with uh, it's very close to um, wheat for obvious reasons. It's, it's used for the same purpose. So we see a very similar um, idea. We look at vetch as um, a. Uh, uh, animal uh, sort of um, uh, fodder um, and we see a relatively decent concentration throughout the island but then oats uh, are much more uh, concentrated in particular areas which again gives you an indication of animal husbandry what kind of animals are uh, used in Cyprus and uh, horses and um, cattle uh, are actually not very commonly uh, present in the economy, which explains the uh, very thin concentration of um, animal uh, cereal. Uh, let's look at some uh, legumes. Uh, broad beans is the king. Uh, are the, yeah, broad, the broad bean is the king of uh, legumes. It's present throughout the island. That was also a bit of a shock for me. I never expected to see it. Uh, Obviously a source of protein. Um, um, Lentils also extremely uh, well distributed. But then if we go to the black-eyed beans, then we see how it's much more specially concentrated. Uh, Whereas Nohut Pilaf clearly was never a hit in Cyprus. Uh, Carobs, again we see an interesting distribution around the coasts of the island. Um, Olive production Mm -hmm. was also a bit of uh, an interesting surprise uh, in the sense that um, quantitatively speaking it was nowhere near as that of Crete or Palestine to the east and the west of the island. Um, However, uh, olives were produced for internal consumption in Cyprus, uh, and this explains the relatively good uh, distribution of uh, olive production. Now, if we divide this by uh, by household, you see a different different, uh, uh, picture uh, to what we had before, obviously has nothing to do, this new distribution has nothing to do with what we saw before with uh, cereals. This was a complete shock. Um, I have no way of explaining this. Uh, It may tell you something about olive culture in Cyprus, 
um, or it may be that it was simply not recorded in other uh, areas and they started recording, the, recording it late uh, in the course of the survey. Uh, speculative answers. Um, I can't really provide a satisfactory one. We go to the third Brodellian, the third part of the Brodellian Trinity, and again we see how it was also not omnipresent in Cyprus. And this uh, confirms this argument that I made in my doctoral thesis that whereas all contemporary historians took overemphasized the importance of wine either because they saw it in the accounts of travelers or consuls uh, or because they saw the high monetary revenue that was coming out of wine um, export uh, what I had argued was that yes this may be true but, but vine trees would expectedly be concentrated in the more mountainous areas of the island and this precisely confirms this idea and it shows that this is a crop that does not affect the whole of the land of the island it does not affect the whole of the economy but simply the areas where it is cultivated if we divide it by household again we see a different uh, distribution um, and despite the fact that it was regionally, the production was regionally concentrated, consumption was a very different story. Uh, we go to animal husbandry, so we see that um, sheep uh, farming is very, very uh, popular, but not as popular as pigs. Now, moving on to industrial crops, uh, cotton is um, uh, quite prominent uh, in Cyprus, but again, my uh, estimate is that quantitatively speaking, this must be rather low compared to the 17th and 18th century, when cotton and silk really become the most important crops in the economy of um, Cyprus. Nevertheless, I was uh, relatively surprised to see how distributed uh, it was. So this data really gives a more tangible picture of how uh, things function. Again, um, looking at the per household spatial distribution, we get different hotspots. Linen was the biggest surprise uh, for me. Uh, I had no idea that it was um, so well distributed uh, and it also provided and it allows for a further thought in that it provided the infrastructure the manufacturing infrastructure for cloth upon which cotton was based later on in eclipsing um, linen by the 17th uh, century hemp uh, very limited production of hemp uh, with which you would which you would need uh, for ropes uh, and you would need if you had ships assuming that you were on a proper island but Cyprus is a peculiar kind of island let's say uh, and in this sense it doesn't really conform to um, this expectation uh, here we see with silk, in the case of silk, how it's, at, it's still at an early stage when it's not as popular, it's not as dominant. Again, by the 17th century, it really becomes one of the three main uh, crops of the island. Uh, as I said, I would expect to find something like this for cotton, but I didn't. So um, there is a lot of value in looking at this uh, quantitative data. Sin hemp. Now here we have gardens and orchards uh, based on the uh, tax paid for that uh, and we see the high concentration around blue uh, and how it completely changes if we divide it by household. So again we see where major units of uh, production are located and they have better access to water uh, resources. Uh, what remains to be done with this uh, project? 
years of GIS uh, data analysis. This will be statistical, spatial, geomorphological, hydrological, um, etc. Uh, and um, uh, all every village that we have will be correlated as a point on the map. It will be correlated with elevation, gradient, soil type, proximity, and access to water resources. In order to understand patterns of crop cultivation, why are particular crops cultivated in those areas with relation to the geo, to the physical conditions, so to speak, uh, and what other crops are usually correlated with them. And this um, um, will allow us to understand why those choices were made. Uh, and at a second level, we can compare present day conditions with what we would have expected to have in the 16th century. Um, now, one final aspect of this project, which concerns the use of cartographic sources and historical maps with GIS methods. Now, before Lord Kitchener acquired global fame as an internet meme, he served in Palestine and Cyprus as a military officer where he compiled uh, highly uh, modern and sophisticated trigonometrical surveys, maps with the cutting edge of technology at the time. And we are fortunate enough to have these maps in for Cyprus. One concerns Nicosia, uh, the city of uh, Nicosia. Uh, the, uh, this was a blueprint that Kitchener made before he made the whole, the, the map of the whole of Cyprus, uh, at a scale of one to six thousand in eighteen. Eighty-one. Uh, this allows us, if we uh, geo-reference this map, uh, we can extract any kind of information recorded on it. So what I did is that I looked at the uh, plots of land shown within the city as having some sort of cultivation. You have some kind of trees and there's a kind of a typology there uh, that I can detect through the way he uh, illustrated everything. Now, we don't have a clear-cut <coughs> legend as to what each symbol means, but you can sort of detect a kind of a pattern, hence the uh, different shades of uh, green. Um, there are 853 uh, plots of um, land in, uh, in the city. Um, 790 of which, um, sorry, 853 that have small scale cultivation uh, with one to four trees recorded there, uh, 790 with dense cultivation, 72 with some kind of a linear depiction of cultivation that I am assuming it's kind of more organized or um, perhaps uh, market oriented. Uh, and 37 with very um, small uh, scale, uh, sorry, low density uh, cultivation, and six of which uh, appear to be public uh, trees in public spaces. Uh, he also records water tanks. I'm not sure if you can see the uh, blue uh, parts here. I think the visualization isn't quite helpful. But you see conduits here, so it allows us to understand how water management uh, took place. We have about 20 uh, conduits here, uh, and wells, of which we have 152, and palm trees. Why not? He chose to record them. Uh, and again, here we can start criticizing our source and think about what these symbols mean, because in Nicosia today you would never see one single palm tree, but rather several. So this is more about a projection of accuracy uh, and uh, attention to detail that he wants to 
show as the modern cartographer uh, who produces knowledge uh, rather than taking it again at face value as an accurate depiction of reality. Uh, we see how all this plays out at a, at a smaller scale of the map. We have here the center of Nicosia uh, around um, the uh, cathedral of uh, Hagia Sophia, Selimi Yajami, uh, and with all the different um, water management uh, data that he produces. Then we go on to the island, to the map of the whole island, produced a few years later at a scale of one to six hundred and fifty thousand. Um, and looking at it closer, here we have um, outside of Nicosia we have different uh, villages recorded here. We have um, chains of wells, uh, Kanat, Lagum, uh, underwater. Uh, systems of uh, channeling water through to um, different areas which again explains how all these water intensive cultivations were possible um, and um, the uh, last line G in Cyprus died about 15 years ago so this was a trade that was still present uh, rather recently but unfortunately it's a lost occupation. Uh, we see how we have aqueducts recorded, uh, different kinds of cemeteries or um, collection of tombs. Um, we have uh, again roads, uh, monasteries, quarries, a uh, chiftlik uh, and a river. So all these, if we uh, georeference this map, all this information we can extract and put on um, use uh, for the purpose of geographic information systems and then correlate all the other data that we have from before and in about 300 years we can safely assume that there aren't any major changes in the landscape uh, on because of modernization of or whatnot because it's still early when the British come to Cyprus and there still aren't any major changes so uh, these provides something else with which we can work uh, on the basis of the 1572 fiscal survey. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, I think we can open the floor to questions. I think, should we arrange, should we bring a chair for you to... I'm happy to stand. You're happy to stand. I'll take a chair. <laughs> <laughs> if I take a photograph of you while you're asking your question. <laughs> so, uh, yes, floor open. Uh, if, because we have so many faces here today, which is such a nice thing for the Institute, if you would like to share your name and your affiliation with us, it would be great. Floor open. Then, ah, yes. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, thank you very much. So it was a pleasure to hear you. I also, uh, I'm uh, also using GIS to understand uh, cities, Ottoman cities. So um, it was for me really a wonderful thing to hear this. Your name and the... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, from Algeria uh, University, uh, history, Department of History and uh, Urban Studies Center. Um, the, uh, your picture, the Meet Perhane uh, picture, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, Meat product production picture, uh, he compared this. Uh, I, I would uh, use the water data uh, mm -hmm. if we we have done perha then perhaps uh, it's just a speculation, but it's good to use the water uh, data to understand places. I use it for uh, my urban uh, production uh, mm -hmm. relations too. Uh, is it, uh, this difference uh, between production and the distribution of uh, the wheat per hane, uh, is it just uh, something uh, like Broda explains the uh, ownership pattern of the land? Uh, that ir by irrigation they uh, lose their land and then uh, in the uh, lower lands we need of course the 
uh, <laughs> other bad data too, and the landowner ownership is then uh, bigger in bigger scale. And that's just a broad volume <laughs> explanation. Mm, mm, mm. It's just a, a thing. I, I don't know if you have uh, checked the uh, ownership, land ownership data. No, I have. I haven't checked data, and it's a very interesting thought. And I'm getting sort of all sorts of. Uh, ideas now that you mentioned. Um, okay, first of all, the main difference that the, the main thing that changes when the Ottomans come to Cyprus is that uh, it becomes a sea of small <coughs> scale uh, cultivators, mm -hmm. either of uh, uh, either as de facto uh, landowners. Um, uh, through usufruct rights or whatever that they can buy and sell usufruct rights actually or inherit mm -hmm. um, so it's not private property but it's very close to that uh, and of course they and the very big uh, Venetian uh, sort of estate uh, they, they take the biggest Venetian estates and they turn them into chief leaks or uh, sultanic lands or whatnot, but really uh, it's a move away from, and I know this is a problematic term, feudalism, uh, since by that stage, you know, it's very difficult to define what feudalism is, uh, and also that the Venetians themselves, uh, even during the Venetian times, you see this transition towards small scale. Uh, cultivation and and uh, land uh, use of fract. Um, so while we don't have any tangible data that we can look at at this stage, at least the overall bigger assumptions uh, are along sort of these lines. So in that sense, uh, it would make sense for sub <coughs> subsistence crop such as wheat to be concentrated in the hands of uh, the many uh, landowners, uh, the, the, the many sort of uh, small scale landowners. So this concentration here uh, may have the complete opposite uh, ownership pattern. So it's something that's worth looking into. Thanks very much. But the because the, but with the only uh, distribution, it's almost the same, so it should be something yeah. related to irrigation. Yeah, 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 yeah. And because access to water is the most valuable asset uh, that would determine the value of your life, really. So, yeah, thanks. Can I ask one more question? Yes, there is another question. <laughs> yes. For me, just mm -hmm. uh, really uh, interesting. Uh, by Nicosia, uh, do you have? Uh, do you have? Uh, it's sometimes good. I use GIS uh, for the sigil to understand the uh, mm -hmm. city's uh, landscape. And what I have, uh, what looking at the names was really important for me because all the uh, three names. Uh, sometimes you can find the three names that are given mm. to the streets mm. now uh, a correlation mm. with, with the 16th century uh, names all the trees in the house mm. uh, definitions so uh, sometimes there's a correlation with that too so mm. uh, na and names of the streets are very useful for water data and it's also really good to learn a uh, which water uh, uh, canal is used for, uh, for for the rest of the production, mm. which is then called Bokludere mm. <laughs> for yes, all yes, the yeah, 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 cities yeah. in the 19th century. Uh, oh, but yeah, I, I wish more studies uh, mm -hmm. would be done in this case. Thank you. Mm. If, ah, yes, there is a question. Um, thank you. Uh, it's really impressive work. Uh, ah, okay. My name is Fahri Dipke from Tel University. Um, have you visited the landscapes uh, in this project to understand uh, the settlements uh, distribution mm -hmm. and 
uh, and the uh, defined the uh, uh, coordinate of all settlements. Have you visited? Uh, no, I, I haven't visited all of them. I've tried, you know, I've, to the extent possible, I went to some places. Uh, this is coordinates will need to be double checked obviously because the coordinates we have is the present day coordinate that's given officially which would be the center of the village that some civil servant decided that it's here and not you know 500 meters down the road um, so that is something that would need to be double checked a b the relocation of villages is certainly something very, very important and that was something the British extensively did in Cyprus for the purposes of uh, policies of reforestation um, that they had. It was, very, it was a, a huge part of the imperial project uh, in Cyprus to reinstitute the this imagined ancient past of Cyprus being covered with forests uh, and of course had no very well, the way they, they, they applied it had no relation to reality. The, the main target, the main enemy against this project was the gold. Uh, and they had extensive campaigns at regulating gold herding and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you speak to any villager in Cyprus, they will tell you they had no idea what they were doing because they can only reach up to some point, they can never destroy a whole tree. But it was such a big part of their rhetoric and, and sort of discourse, colonial discourse, uh, that really deserves its study itself. In any case, within that context of trying to reforest uh, Cyprus, they would move, relocate several villages. So again, uh, some uh, points on the map would need to be uh, corrected and, and, and reassessed in that region. Uh, I ask this question because when I worked in Eskishir and Lich region, uh, before my study I uh, look at and read uh, Deftars uh, and I listed the village. Then, when I went to the area, uh, their locations were completely different. Uh, today is modern village, most, uh, most of them. And on the other hand, some villages I found the Ottoman village, the pottery I found the potteries and uh, it dated to Ottoman period. But I haven't uh, uh, I, I haven't seen this village in the Deftash. Mm -hmm. And some uh, some villages uh, uh, when I work uh, talk with the uh, villagers, uh, they said, "Oh, we stayed there, then." Uh, the the people in the village uh, 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 went to uh, another villages. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, I think that uh, we must we must not uh, trust deftars very much. Yeah. It's a little bit. Uh, it can be sometimes problematic. Yes. So uh, visiting the landscape in detail. It's uh, uh, it's very important and uh, using the FTARs through this uh, detailed survey uh, 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 it, it's work uh, much better I think uh, this is another question uh, do you have any uh, 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 re, uh, reconstruction of landscape data from the uh, uh, lakes uh, or other uh, uh, watery areas uh, from from the uh, yes place. because uh, my area completely different in 16th century mm -hmm. uh, in 19th century the the area Eskishir and Bilijik, uh, ha uh, had mo uh, modern projects uh, uh, to settle uh, the new commerce from Balkans and from Russia and after that the landscape completely changed mm -hmm. so I think uh, and do you have any data uh, to uh, reconstruct the 16th century uh, 
uh, Cyprus. Uh, the Mufassal Deftari itself doesn't mention anything about uh, water resources or landscape or whatever. Uh, we do have some descriptions from travelers uh, that we can use to some extent uh, and other uh, Ottoman sources there's this amazing uh, letter actually of this um, small scale, he's like a naid in Tuzla and he's writing a letter to his uh, creditor and he says, you know, would you lend me this extra amount of money? I am about to uh, collect my harvest. And the fields, all of the Masari is like a sea of cotton, uh, which again shows you how prolific it was at the time. So you have these kind of, let's say, impressionistic sources that would, you know, if you're lucky enough to find that for a particular region then you may get something but the act, the real value and the, I consider myself very lucky to have the Kitchener map at my disposal because as I said apart from climate induced changes in the landscape there shouldn't be any major man-made changes on the landscape uh, and what about what you said before for the villages the Kitchener map also records ruins which allows me again to speculate based on the proximity of the villages or of a place name that doesn't exist anymore if I see ruins then I could assume that it's, it's somewhere around there and again as a historian this is where I am I feel it's very beneficial to work with archaeologists because I was able to georeference several points on the map that don't exist anymore from their own surveys, from the ruins that they found and from conducting ethnographic work in a particular survey area and they told me yes the place name that you have called whatever uh, it's right over there, there's ruins over there so I have the geo, the, the coordinates, and I can put them on my uh, database. And, you know, a problem solved. So this kind of uh, <coughs> methodological uh, sort of tools uh, borrowed from uh, archaeology and from landscape analysis are absolutely necessary and very, very useful. Yes. I'd like to take a Middle East Technical University in the Department of Political Science. Um, I think it actually was really uh, nice. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, I have one point uh, about uh, an assumption you made at the end of towards the end of your uh, presentation, and just repeated that there shouldn't uh, uh, be any major changes in the landscape uh, before the British came. Uh, I think it's a bit problematic, uh, especially when you talk about. Uh, also, because you also talk about Nicosia, right? I mean, now there we have uh, a literature, a bunch of works uh, arguing and showing that uh, the Tanzimat reforms really changed the urban landscape uh, even uh, before. I'm, th th there's a debate whether, uh, it's part of a debate whether the ch change is uh, coming from the West or is uh, essential, yeah, but yeah. Uh, for, um, wherever the change is coming from, uh, we now know that uh, the, the Tanzimat reforms and the, or the 19th century uh, the, uh, the capitalism integration with the world economy, whatever you call it, changed a lot, especially in terms of uh, urban landscape, <coughs> perhaps as Fari uh, pointed out, maybe in the rural landscape as well. So that assumption might be a bit, a bit problematic. You're, you're absolutely right, uh, and I would agree with you, so I would certainly agree with you as far as the urban landscape is concerned. And I should have clarified that this assumption is more about the rural landscape mm. rather than the mm. urban landscape. Uh, from the studies of the roads, for example, that I've seen, there hasn't been any major change uh, before the British came. And it, uh, even, uh, and it took them a long time actually to build new roads that would change um, the rural landscape. 
uh, or as far as major irrigation works uh, were concerned in the form of you know, aqueducts or uh, drainage of swamps. You know, drainage doesn't start until the latter parts of the uh, 19th century with the um, import of eucalyptus trees. Uh, so, uh, in this, you know, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it, you know, I shouldn't have put it so categorically um, that there wasn't any major change. But to rephrase, if there were any major changes, I would be very surprised in the rural landscape, particularly. Uh, as far as the urban landscape is concerned, you're absolutely right. I mean, you can also see it in the form of uh, tours being placed on major Venetian buildings or even the walls of Nicosia uh, don't have any in Ottoman insignia from the 16th century, and they have them uh, with Mahmoud II's uh, tour. You know, uh, so uh, there's. You, 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 you see it also visibly in the form of uh, built environment, uh, interventions on the built environment itself. So, yeah. Daniel? Yeah, Daniel from British Institute. Uh, I guess I have a question about uh, how the analysis you're doing is, I mean, it's really interesting. Like, how, but how much of this, is there any analysis going on in the Ottoman period of these, this data? I mean, is it just purely for like tax purposes that they're collecting this data, or is there any kind of deve de deve developmentalist kind of approach here? Like, do they, or is that kind of the information that they're using for that coming from some other source? Like, I mean, are they looking and saying, you know, there should really be more wheat cultivation in this neighborhood? Like, why is it not happening? We should do something about it. No, or is that something that comes later? This is, no, this is, this is purely fiscal, as far as I can understand. Like the, the comments that I see, the, 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 the minutes, the additional uh, documents that are sort of uh, inserted in the register, um, they all concern purely fiscal um, issues. There isn't any evidence, recorded evidence of uh, a developmentalist logic. That's not to say that there isn't any, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, there's I guess no way to know, I guess. One of the things that you're telling me about this uh, climate, climactic change is kind of interesting to me is how much this then, like, this climactic change becomes woven into, like you said, this like imperialist or Ottoman developmentalist narratives about decline, or the, you know, like the same happens when. The, in the Greek occupation of Izmir, for example, they make reference to many older texts that say how green and how mm -hmm. fertile and so on. This should be reinstituting the past yeah. glory, and, and there's stuff done about like the use of biblical uh, descriptions of the Middle East for by you know 19th century imperialists with the same kind of ideas of recreating or recreating this amazing fertile past. And I never thought about this being kind of having a climactic dimension. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. Thanks. Uh, Jasmine, British Institute. Uh, I was intrigued by a um, detail that you showed on the kitchen uh, level. More specifically, the system of wells. Maybe that's something that is normal in arid uh, areas. Oh, yes. I'm Syria, Cyprus, North Africa, well, it's everywhere. That's probably draining the water, the groundwater directly. Or where, what are they, those systems of wells used for? And are they all of the, the, the island or is it only specific places? It's all over the, well, it's, it's in specific areas and it's underground water resources. The actual technique yes. is amazing. Uh, the, 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 as a technological kind of thing, it's amazing. Uh, there have been a lot of studies in Syria mm -hmm. about, uh, about how it works and how it was organized um, uh, since ancient times. I mean, this is a very ancient kind of system of water management. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, what would what you would need uh, is rich underground water resources uh, and apparently a very uh, short and nimble person to go uh, down and. Uh, take care of the, of the underground water channels.
and are they used for uh, for uh, agricultural education or for this? And I mean, the, to come back to the, you know, the question of, you know, um, how, my, how many assumptions can we make? I mean, the richness of this map <coughs> and the, how rare it is and the data that it gives you, uh, it really is a pity to sort of let it go to waste. Um, especially for things that have to do with the non-built environment, the, the, the natural landscape, so to speak. Uh, we can talk about villages, we can talk about urban spaces, yes, but as far as um, other parts of the rural landscape are concerned, like wells, like chains of wells, uh, like streams, uh, all these issues, uh, or, or even the ruins that allow us to sort of georeference particular uh, abandoned villages. Um, it really is a blessing to have this kind of a resource uh, available and I'm shocked at how it hasn't been georeferenced yet. And I, I'm actually in, in collaboration with a, uh, with a company in Cyprus to georeference this. Um, uh, because again it was using cutting edge methods of the time very accurate with the technological needs of the time but at the same time it has major problems as far as the coastline is concerned problems of accuracy mm -hmm. uh, and we're trying to rectify all these issues in order to uh, properly uh, georeference the map okay, so yes, about them. <laughs> I was just going to ask how, how uh, you would use the, uh, the Kissinger map because I'm uh, Pretty much ignorant about GIS, so uh, so d d d uh, uh, will you like uh, use it like, uh, like sandwich, like photo sandwich, like two maps and then existing map and this map and the <laughs> older map you uh, produced on the base of Mufasal Deftar, or uh, you mean by GIS reference, uh, referencing digitizing the data on this and then using it uh, or, or both? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean. I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what, what we're trying to do is to uh, georeference them this map by rectifying. So, for example, uh, we have a database of all uh, monuments, churches, uh, mosques uh, that we can use as points on a map and uh, as, as control points uh, in order to be able to. Uh, digitalize the whole map. Uh, from then on, we will start uh, extracting all the pieces of information here, and I can create different data sets from all this. So, where are water resources? Where are where are all the wells? Where are all the streams? Where are the rivers? This, that, the other, uh, and then again try and find a way to create relational databases and correlate that data. A, with the existing geophysical data that we have today, so see how that, uh, how, if this, is an, if this is any degree of accuracy of depiction of that environment, how does that compare to what we have now? Uh, and on that basis, assess the reliability of this, and then all that, on that basis, try to come up of, with ways to correlate 1572 data with this. So if I find a place where there's a particularly high concentration of cotton, for example, or um, silk, which you know, mulberry trees require daily uh, watering, uh, I would go to Kitchener and see what he records there and understand, okay, does, is this justified by them? That, that kind of... Uh, yeah. Yes, we have another five minutes, so let's pick some questions. Uh, Elie is at the back. Yes. Uh, Antoine Sajuk Tursun from the Middle East Technical University History Department. Uh, thanks for this fascinating presentation. And um, I have one question. Uh, which software do you use for producing these maps? And also, 
another, sorry for this comment, but you don't need to use GIS to produce these maps uh, because you can produce uh, those maps with AutoCAD as well. And I see that you don't use layers and to compare uh, uh, data from, for example, uh, wheat production and millet production and uh, water places, water places. And uh, why don't you use layers to uh, extract some more information, more comparing uh, from your data? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions that we can? If not, yes. Uh, well, first of all, I use ArcGIS. Um, and yeah, I mean, rather than using AutoCAD, rather I'm, I'm using ArcGIS so that I can do much more sophisticated analysis at the later stage. I mean, what I presented here is the very early stages of analysis. You know, the the, the, the data was just finished in terms of transcribing, having a very preliminary statistical analysis and whatnot, and my main concern was to see the distribution of particular crops. What you just mentioned exactly is the next stage to start putting layers, see how things correlate with each other, have um, correlation coefficient analysis between different crops and see what patterns show up, uh, what elevation, for example, uh, particular crops are appearing to in, in higher frequency. All these issues are the next stage of um, of analysis, and that's why I'm using ArcGIS so that I can sort of be consistent uh, at, at a later, more demanding uh, stage in terms of analysis. Yes. Elevation data, uh, for example, that's really important uh, to find the seashore, the change in the seashore. Uh, it was for 16th century uh, Tekirda, in my case, uh, two meters, there was two meters uh, change. Mm -hmm. So I reconstructed it using, using the elevation data. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe really uh, good to use uh, yeah. GIS in this case. And if you perhaps have the uh, GIS data to, for, from today, then it's really also uh, use, uh, wonderful to use that data from the uh, municipalities uh, uh, mm. to use the data there can be really good. And for the names, in the, in the, uh, the change in the names, you know, it's really uh, interesting because uh, even the quarter names <coughs> have changed uh, very much in the cities. And uh, in Marsin and Tarsus, you know, they changed the uh, place in, in 19th century, uh, the settlement in the 19th century. So this means also uh, something to have to perhaps changed here too. We have to lo uh, look the change in the rivers in how many years the rivers change their uh, ways. That's really important. If you take the rivers today, and we have to work for that thing with the archaeologists. It's really a need to work around with archaeologists just for them too, because for, in my case, for, for example, I found the uh, old walls which were not there, but every Acheri mm. was there. But there was the old walls, because the old walls have, uh, the stones of the old walls have uh, salt in the 16th century. Uh, these walls were from the six, uh, 16th uh, hundreds, so <laughs> it's really important to work with the archaeologists in the Ottoman studies. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, and that, that's what I'm trying to do. I, mean. <laughs> I think there is one last question at the back, and then we can continue over a snack and a wine. Okay, so thanks. Thank you so much, Antoine. Uh, that's one question for your um, uh, survey register. Do you see, um, in your particular case, do you see um, the boundaries of the rural settlements similar to that of Crafton survey? No, this is the yeah, this is the old style uh, yes. Pathway yes. which basically records volume and value uh, of uh, agricultural production. Um, so in terms of spatial analysis, it is useful? <coughs> yes, in terms of spatial analysis. That's why I said interpolation gives you an idea of, of trends, but not of literal spatial 
um, analysis. With Crete, however, because you have two surveys, sure. you one have, is similar to the previous one. One is exactly the same as this so, one. Exactly. And the second one is that the novelty that records um, uh, size of land plots and number of uh, trees or crops or whatever you have there. So the challenge there would be to find a way to make the data compatible, bring them into dialogue somehow uh, and see the correlation. And again there of course you have the problem that the um, sixteen fifty something uh, first register uh, survey is after the war, uh, so you have about twenty odd years uh, of change in agricultural patterns, cultivation patterns, whatever. So uh, again, that comparison uh, would be would need to be made in a cautious fashion. But it is an exciting prospect to see uh, how you could make that data comparable. Com uh, comparable. It's a challenging task. Very, 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 very. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not happy to with that. On that note, thank you so much for your talk. Thank you so much for your participation. <laughs> and we can continue over.